people from outside the city. So this was designed to kind of correct some of those. Another is to improve funding for our crown jewels, as they called it in the presentation back in 1995. These are the places that we love, the zoo, the aviary, FIPS, our museums, things that we all enjoy throughout Western Pennsylvania. Reducing fiscal disparities for local government, I mean, particularly for some of these smaller steel towns that are losing money, losing population, they simply, you know, especially back in the, the late 80s, early 90s, just didn't have enough to keep the lights on for the city. Relieving over-reliance on other taxes. So as all this is going on, there's a lot, especially in the city of Pittsburgh, reliance on the personal property tax. So having to pay taxes on any, you know, cars, boats, other, you know, luxury items that you have, uh, and especially the amusement tax, the, the sports teams, concert promoters, hated having a 10% amusement tax. It was tougher to get more events and concerts into the city, and it was holding Pittsburgh back from hosting some of these. And then the last was to establish a precedent for regional cooperation. You know, we still hear this a lot today. Should there be more mergers between local governments? Should there be you know, more cooperation among EMS agencies and other things? This was a, a way to have that sort of regional cooperation to say, yes, we do have different borders, but we're all joined together. One of the things they brought up in this 1995 presentation was, this is a rare sales tax that the Chamber of Commerce actually supported. The Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce said, yeah, we don't like taxes, none of us do, but this is a tax that will work for everybody and achieve these other objectives and allow people to come together from all throughout Allegheny County and work together to make sure we keep these places open and keep them thriving. So how much money? Over the last almost 30 years that we've had a rad tax, more than $4 billion from one penny per dollar, $4 billion has been raised and invested into our region since they started collecting that sales tax in 1995. And you know, really impressive number as I take a sip here. I feel like one of the Backstreet Boys with the uh, little headset here. All right, now let's, let's break down where it all goes. I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but you can kind of see from the, from the one penny and the $4 billion, where does it all go? This is, the, this is what we funded last year. This is 2022. Uh, libraries, 31%, about 38.4 million for CLP, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, and all the other public libraries all throughout Allegheny County. And then parks and trails, as I mentioned, not for small community parks, but for larger regional parks, regional trails. So in the city, that's Frick Park, Shenley Park, Riverview, Emerald View, and one I'm surely forgetting. Um, Frick, Shenley, Highland Park. Highland Park was the fifth that I forgot. Um, and then the, the county park system as well. So anything from you know, North Park to Settler's Cabin, South Park, Boyce Park, um, White Oak Park. 
all included in the county park system. And then you've got trail systems, um, things like the, the Rachel Carson Trail or the Three Rivers Trail, you know, some bits of the Great Allegheny Passage helped um, by this sales tax. Next up, we've got arts and culture and sports and civic facilities. Those facilities being the stadiums and the convention center and arts and culture um, encompassing a range of organizations, everything from the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra and the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, you know, big organizations to, to smaller ones. Here uh, in Swickley, you've got the Sweetwater Center for the Arts. They are one of the beneficiaries of the tax. Um, next up, we've got the, the smaller ones, regional attractions. That's basically what we call the zoo, FIPS, and the aviary. These original um, organizations that quite frankly, in those late 80s, early 90s, could have closed entirely. I think Mayor Maslow had the joke about, you know, $900,000 going to the aviary from the city budget. She said, why don't we just open the doors and let the birds fly away? <laughs> Couldn't do that. And so Mayor Maslow, along with other city and county leaders at the time, privatized those institutions, made them nonprofit entities, and said, all right, you're, you're going to have to make your own way, but you will benefit from the sales tax, so they, they still do today, each of them getting between you know, two to four million dollars of tax money. And we'll see the results here in a second. Three million dollars to public transit and just over a million dollars for administration, which is the office I work in. We have uh, six employees at RAD, I'm one of the six, and we're in charge of making sure that all this money goes where it's supposed to and watching it all, and I'll get more into that uh, at the end of my presentation. So in 1995, there were just 46 RAD assets, some of the ones that I, that I mentioned earlier on. Now, we support over 100 of them, and they're all throughout the county, touching you know, every corner of the area. And since 1995, 800 million visits when you total up the zoo, the aviary, FIPS, the museums, the stadiums, the arena, the convention center, all of these different places have seen 800 million going through the doors, not 800 million people, and people go to multiple ball games and, and, and other events like that, but 800 million through those turnstiles, if it were, to these places. And they're economic drivers. Um, a, little, a little stat here for you, back in 2005, our assets employed some 6,200 people. Since then, it's almost doubled. The assets that we fund employ more than 13,000 people. We, we all hear about you know, Pittsburgh's region being uh, driven by eds and meds, the universities and the hospitals, uh, but this is a huge number of people that are employed by our regional assets, by our arts and culture, by you know, quality of life institutions that we have. And then going back to the aviary, the zoo, and FIPS, in the early 90s, when they were you know, just city departments, they only employed a, a few dozen people to, I don't know, put out the bird feed and, and do it, <laughs> whatever. But now they are large institutions in their own right. They employ, in the case of the zoo and FIPS, hundreds of people. We've got five times as many people working at the zoo and FIPS as they did back then. They are their own institutions. And in, in most cases, they are getting a small amount of their money from the RAD tax, I mean, a small percentage. They have become their own financiers. They, they raise their own funds. They have members and donors and all of these things. Mayor Maslow's goal was accomplished in that sense. They became self-sustaining and were able to become institutions that support themselves and grow and be larger, employ more people, and really be stronger having both public and private investment in them. If you've been to Phipps or you've been to the aviary recently, you know that they put a lot of money into restoring, renovating, and making these places really stronger than they've ever been before. It's, it's a fantastic success story in that sense. Our libraries, I could, I could talk about uh, public libraries for, for days, but I'll, I'll leave it to this. That is the visits per capita. If we go back to the early 90s, visitor rates to Allegheny County libraries were about half of the national average. These were places that were underfunded. They were kind of falling apart in some places because they were not getting the resources that they needed. So in comes the RAD tax. In comes a regional investment in these public libraries. And it took a while, it took a few years, but in the early 2000s, 
they're at their weight class. They're about average for library visits per capita. Then 2000s, late 2000s recession hits, local governments across the country facing a lot of fiscal issues. Nobody, nobody blames them for having to cut some you know, tax revenue that used to go to the libraries. You've got difficult decisions to make. But for us in Allegheny County, we always had the rad tax. We always had our ability to sustain, have consistent levels of funding for our public libraries. And you see the results. They are now punching above their weight class. They're saying these are institutions that are important for a community to have. These third places, as the sociologist Ray Oldenburg puts it. This is not home. This is not work. This is a third place to gather. This men's club, an example of a third place that is important to have that sort of social infrastructure that, it, that exists. Parks, we can certainly see it in these. I, I uh, credit um, one, of the, one of my coworkers at RAD, Meredith Soder. Um, in her PhD program, she was actually researching RAD for her dissertation and gathering some of this information about RAD's history and RAD's past. And so this was Anderson Playground in Shenley Park. Not exactly a place you'd want to send your kids. But RAD tax money comes in, a regional investment. You're able to take down those rickety old things and put in some new playground equipment. And this is not even the end of it, because currently the city of Pittsburgh is saying, we actually, you know, we're trying to make it state of the art. And so they have plans for even bigger dinosaurs, as it's known in the city, dinosaur playground, um, to really attract everybody and give kids a, a place to go that's safe, that's enjoyable, that's, that's fun for them. The Forbes and Braddock Playground at Frick Park. Uh, I know I see a ton of folks there that are either from the city or from outlying areas close by. You know, that's close to Wilkinsburg and Edgewood and Swissvale. But it's a city park. It used to be only funded by the city. Now it gets funding from the region. And so you're able to replace some of these old things and make a new playground that I can tell you last weekend um, when we drove by, because my girlfriend lives in Regent Square, so many people, dozens of people enjoying on a beautiful day, both the city and from outside. The cultural district. All right, so this, this is an example of what is talked about a lot in Pittsburgh that we punch above our weight class in terms of arts and culture. And a lot of times people say, well, it's because you know, back in the day you had your Andrew Carnegie and your Frick and your Shenley, and they, they left all of these wonderful institutions for us and you know, we just kind of sustain them to this day. That's true in a sense. We are lucky to have wonderful cultural gems that were left by the sort of you know, gilded age barons of yesteryear. But it doesn't tell the whole story because the strength of Pittsburgh's cultural district, a lot comes from the public investment. So institutions like the symphony, the ballet, the CLO, dance council, opera, and the cultural trust have come from RAD support. Back before we had RAD funding in the early 90s, the cultural district saw about a million people attending a year, and in ticket revenue, about $20 million, or 45 million adjusted for inflation. Looking at all of the, the public investment, the private investment, the institutions that have been put into the cultural district, pre-COVID, these were the pre-COVID numbers, nearly double what the attendance was in 1990. So that, that shows how many people are coming, not just from this area, but I know people travel from Youngstown and Cleveland and, and from West Virginia and even you know counties to the east and say, they want to spend a night out in Pittsburgh. They want to come in and enjoy these places. And the ticket revenue shows that as well. Uh, nearly $70 million in cultural district ticket revenue is nearly one and a half times what it was uh, even adjusted for inflation in the late 80s and early 90s. And the amusement tax that I mentioned earlier, this was a, kind of a, a problem for the city, unable to attract events with a 10% amusement tax. So they said, all right, if we pass this RAD tax, you have to cut that from 10% to 5%. You have to drop the personal property tax. You have to make other tax reform measures because we're not just going to give you this money as extra. You have to do some tax reform yourself. So all right, tax revenue or tax rate is cut from 10% to 5% on the amusement tax. Obviously, immediately you see a drop in revenue. You, you cut your rate, it'll, it'll drop down. But over time, 
we see the results. We see that revenue goes up and outpaces inflation. And that kind of goes to show in this sense that they were right about the amusement tax. It was keeping more events from coming to the city. And if you drop it down a little bit, it allows more promoters and more shows to come in. And it ultimately, you get just as much revenue, if not more, than you did at the 10% rate. All right, so this is, this is the municipal side of all of it. We talk about the $4 billion. Half of the money is going to the regional asset district, everything I showed you with the penny. But the other half is going to municipalities. So this was, this was the way they designed the 1% sales tax. Half is going to go to RAD. Half is going to go to local governments. And after uh, municipalities enacted tax reform, like some of the tax reforms that I talked about, it's an unrestricted money. So they, they get their check from Act 77 and can use it for whatever they need in terms of local government. I gathered some of the local municipalities here. Smaller ones like Glen Osborne, small population, small amount of money, 16,000, 262,000 over time. Not, not too much, but important. Um, Leedsdale, one of the reasons I, I bring up Leedsdale is because the, the municipal funding is not just you have X number of people, you get Y dollars. There's a formula that the state has that says it's population, it's your tax base, you know, your median house sales, and you know, basically wanting to make sure that these distressed communities that were losing jobs, that were losing people, got money that could help sustain them. So Leedsdale 2022, about $73,000 and more than a million dollars since 1995. That's important for a community like Leedsdale, you know, that's a police officer. That's you know the ability to sustain services that you might not be able to otherwise. Um, for Swickley in 2022, is 141,000 over 2.4 million since 1995, and a huge funder for the city and for the county. The city of Pittsburgh just to fund their local government, 560 million dollars in RAD funding since 1995, and for county, the county government more than 1.1 billion dollars. And this is it, it, a, a huge amount of money, but as we all know, county government has a lot of responsibilities, particularly for our roads and bridges. When we see them you know, restoring the, the three bridges connecting the North Shore to downtown, the Clemente Bridge, the Warhol Bridge, the Carson Bridge, those are Allegheny County owned bridges. So when they do a big restoration project, that's county government funds that go to restoring this. And all of this does not include the amount of funding that the assets have received. So if you see the, the Suwickley number, that doesn't include what the Suwickley Library has received or what Pittsburgh institutions have received. A few more slides to get through here. But the property tax reform measure is what I, what I want to talk about on the municipal side. Because immediately when municipalities agreed to property tax reform, to be able to get this money, they had to agree to hold the line on real estate taxes. And 111 of the 128 municipalities immediately reduced their real estate taxes. It's not a total success story. 46 of them still have lower rates than they did in 1995. But if you know your math, you know that that means that 65 of them have the same or higher rates. So not a total success story, but it is important to see that Yes, you're getting this RAD tax money. That means you're putting less of a burden on your homeowners, on your property taxpayers. And now it's, it's an important uh, piece of the pie for the majority of municipalities. 73 out of 128. That's more than half of municipalities that get at least 5% of their budget from the Act 77 sales tax. If you, if you are a council member or you know one, you know how important these you know, funding pieces are on the margins. If you have to cut 7% of your municipal budget, those are huge cuts. That's huge to make. And so this sales tax money has been important for every local government throughout Allegheny County. So even if you don't have a library or a park or something in your community where you live, you're still benefiting from the sales tax because your, your municipality is getting money from it. All right, that's all, that's all the history, that's all the past. I appreciate you going, going through the numbers with me. I find it fascinating myself. Um, but a, li a little bit about me, what do I do? What, what does the RAD office do? Well, 
basically, I'm, I'm publicizing all of this. I'm, I'm putting it out there that this money that you pay, you know, we're working for you to make sure that it's going to the proper places. So libraries or the zoo or parks and stadiums, you know, we're in charge of making sure that it goes to the proper place and that we're letting people know that this all is happening and that we're open and transparent about it and allows me to do things like this. Um, one of the big things that I do through this job and that RAD does is what we call radical days. And maybe you've been a part of it in the past, in, uh, in the fall, usually September, October, our regional assets basically say thank you. We're, we're gonna open up for free, we're gonna have free admission or free event or a free concert. Um, from the Heinz History Center, there was, last year there was free skating at PBG Paints Arena or you know, hand uh, artwork demonstrations. They had events for kids or you know, they open up the museum for free. The Pittsburgh Glass Center, which I love, they had open demonstrations for people to come and make things. Uh, Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra down in the bottom left, they had a free show. People could come to Heinz Hall, didn't have to pay a ticket price. A wonderful thing to have to see a world-class symphony orchestra completely free of charge. Or in the case of the Steelers, you could tour the stadium for free. They offered free tours all day. And I, I followed the, some of the kids around that were taking tours for the day and they loved it to be able to go into the Steelers locker room, see everything, it, just a wonderful feeling. So that's one of the things that I, I coordinate are those radical days in the fall. I, basically, I call myself a publicist for attacks. That, that's basically what I am. I'm a, I'm a tax publicist. These, this is what's happening, and this is me telling the public what is going on with the tax money. Sometimes that means having media events. A couple of weeks ago, we had an event at this, um, I guess you could call it a, a sculpture. It's, it's a new piece of artwork that also has a sort of interactive element. You can swing around on the chairs. And this is in Frick Park behind the Blue Slide Playground in Frick Park. And we had a big media event. The mayor was there, our vice chair, Dusty Kirk was there. Some of the artists that have worked on new pieces throughout the city. This was us publicizing that, hey, we gave some uh, extra grants to create new pieces of artwork in the city parks. And we want folks to be able to come and enjoy them and know that Art isn't just something that is on a museum wall or you know something to purchase. It's it's out in our parks in the public for for people to enjoy. Um, so that that's something that we did a couple of weeks ago. Um, I had to talk on WTAE about it appear on TV. If you if you notice, I kind of have the same outfit for talking then as I do now. I guess this is my public speaking outfit. Um, but that, that's one of the things I do. Is, you know. I'm the spokesperson, I let folks know what's going on. Social media content, obviously huge now. We have Rad on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, um, letting folks know not just about what Rad funding is doing, because it might be boring if you just say over and over again, we fund libraries, we fund parks. But our assets do an incredible job of offering free events throughout the year, not just during radical days in the fall, but all throughout the year they say, you know, we're offering this for Mother's Day or we're having this community event where kids can come and do arts and crafts or different things like that. So we publicize those and, you know, we're, we're a, a quasi-government entity as I call it. So there are other things that we're required to do, like, you know, post about our, our, our board meetings, things that are going on when we get into budget budget time in the fall, letting people know, hey, you can offer public comment on the budget, things like that. But mostly it's about making sure people know that when you get that receipt, say at a restaurant or a store or what have you, and it's a 7% sales tax, well, that 1% extra is going to all of these great places. It's also about acknowledgement. If you, if you go around onto websites for the aviary, the history center, they have that little RadWorks here logo at the bottom. That's important. They want to make sure that they're thanking taxpayers for that. And this is all throughout. If you, if you start looking for it, you'll see it in a lot of different places. You'll see it at the bottom of email newsletters, FIPS, uh, the Allegheny County Parks and Sweetwater. They'll thank RAD for their support, just like they do other funders. Um, when they have events, they might have a, a RAD yard sign or special thanks or other things that have the, the RAD logo. Um, especially electronically for Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures or for when we have tours like at the Convention Center. 
And then you have um, what I call the famous rad window cling, which you will see a lot of different places if you're looking for them. So for instance, at um, the Arcade Comedy Theater downtown or over here, the Science Center has a little rad works here. Um, that, I make sure I wanna see it. That's why I give it a thumbs up. I, d I don't wanna see the older uh, rad logo. This is from like the, the late 90s but it's, it's still around, so a small part of my job is kind of being the logo patrol. Like, why is this thing still up? We, we, that was two logos ago, so that's part of my job as well. And, and letting people know why that acknowledgement is important. Having those window clings is a way to thank the public. It's an educational tool, just, you know, I can't go around giving speeches to 40 people at a time. I, I'd like to, this would be, you know, good way to spend my time, but it probably wouldn't get to all, you know, million plus people in Allegheny County, 40 at a time. So having these out there is, is a tool for education, demonstrates the public investment that you guys make every day when you're making your purchases. And millions of people see it by going through the doors of the Science Center or the museums. Um, they see that RAD truly does work here. That is what I have for my presentation. Like I said, if you, if you um, have any questions, you can uh, well, you can ask me right now, but if you have any questions that you think of later, you have my email address there. And uh, if you're on social media, you can tag at rad at radworks here. But I, I see we already have some questions. I have a on question uh, over here oh. on the mic. Yeah, there are two mics. <laughs> okay. No, go ahead. Um, I, uh, when large purchases, Mm -hmm. like TVs, refrigerators, et cetera. Sure. I do not purchase them anymore in Allegheny County. Yeah. And I was wondering, uh, do you guys do any estimate as to how much business has the RAD tax has driven to Butler, Beaver, other counties? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we actually do. One of the things that our controller does is, as our financial analyst, you know, her, her biggest role is taking the tax money from from when we receive it and making sure all the checks go out to the right places. But one of the other things she does is we get uh, data from the state, from the state revenue department every month about our own tax revenues and about what's happening in other counties. And so she can actually look and see in outlying counties, you know, are, is Butler performing better? Is Washington performing better? And can do that sort of math to see. Now, what you bring up is absolutely true. If, you, if you're looking to save on that extra 1% on a big purchase, you, you can go up to, to Cranberry or you know, down to you know, Meadows in Washington County and, and make those purchases, and, and nothing is stopping you. However, what they've, what they've figured out over the years is that margin of what Allegheny County is losing is negligible compared to what has been gained from restaurants, from now Amazon purchases, most online purchases were able to collect the extra money. And a big part of the revenue is from motor vehicle sales, which as you may or may not know, is for the county that you're registered in, not when you're buying. So if you went to Washington Ford to buy a Ford, but your re car is registered in Allegheny County, you'll still pay the Allegheny County sales tax. Does that answer that for you? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, that uh, it's a bad idea, though. Oh sure, and, and you are, you are more than than welcome to. Um, but they've determined over the years that 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 sort of activity it, it's negligible over time. Yes, sir. Uh, on your very first uh, slide, yes. you, where the money goes, uh -huh. you had that category at the bottom of miscellaneous organizations that provide value to the, uh, sure. to the community. Yep. Would our senior men's club fit that category? Uh, it might. And how would we apply for funds under that? It, it might. What I, what, I, what I tell folks is that ultimately it takes six or seven votes from the RAD board. If you, if you can convince our seven RAD board members that this is important, then yeah, you could. Well, how do we do that? Write a letter? <laughs> I'm, ser I'm serious. Uh, oh, no. The, the treasurer would do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear a couple grand. Well, here, I'll, I'll tell you two things. One is kind of outside of the law, you know, this is kind of what Act 77 lays out. Since then, um, RAD has kind of, you know, over the years created its own policy, its own sort of like guidelines. So things like, you know, 
local sports teams, like if you have a local, you know, soccer club, they generally don't fund that. Um, there, there are other things that like over the years they've gotten requests for, but they generally don't fund. However, like I said, it's, it's six out of seven. So Rad at any time could say no, like, you know, local, you know, fraternal organizations, clubs, these are worthwhile. And so if you, for instance, for the men's club or any other club would want to apply for Rad funding, the first thing you do is you call us up. You, you talk to one of our program officers and you say, hey, I represent such and such organization. We're interested in Rad funding. What can you tell me? And then we can start the process from there. Um, I gave out the, um, the flyer, the brochure to most people. It has our website, radworkshere.org. That has a lot of sections up at the top where you can see you know, complete details on, if you're an interested organization, how you apply for funding. So that would be an example there. Okay, Jim, Jim, whoa, whoa, yes, whoa, whoa. hey, Tom, hold okay, on a second. Sorry. Okay, Joe. Yeah, I noticed there's uh, uh, one group that is uh, obviously not talked about. Mm -hmm. How is the Warhol funded? Oh, great question. So the Warhol is one of our organizations that's funded. It goes through the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. So the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh, which contains the Carnegie Museum of Art and Natural History in Oakland, the Carnegie Science Center on the North Shore, and then the Andy Warhol Museum, four together under one organization, and they've been all funded by RAD from the very beginning. So RAD has a contract with the Carnegie Museums, give the funding to them, and they decide from there where it goes to. Yes, you're welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, a two-point question. Yes. Who audits RAD? It is, it is, if you, if you watch your Pennsylvania lottery every night, you know that the Pennsylvania lottery is independently audited by Zelenkovsky Axelrod. So are we. We are audited by Zelenkovsky Axelrod. Okay, and you said some of those municipalities haven't lowered their rate or property tax. Yep. Is there any way that there's a control? In other words, Rad has no control over those municipalities when he gives them the money? Basically, no. We, we are in charge of the other half of everything that I laid out. The, the requirements that municipalities had were all laid out under Act 77. When Governor, K Governor Casey signed it at the end of 1993, it said that they had to do certain things in order to receive RAD tax money. You know, holding the line on property taxes for, I think it was five years at first, was one of those things. But after they met those requirements, it is on from there. They, they can decide what they do with the money. It's a good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, my first question was related to where you buy your car. And, <laughs> and I know I've always paid uh, a red, an extra percent when I buy my car. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that surprised me, I've always been under the impression that the far and away, the vast majority of these funds mm -hmm. went to sports facilities and sports teams. Yeah. And it's not the case. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how often I hear that because... I think it all came from the sort of plan B discussion and controversy back in the late 90s. You know, you, you first had the regional renaissance initiative, which I believe was eight counties voting to fund new stadiums, and it went to the polls and no, like something like 70% down. Then there kind of became this sort of lingering idea that like, though this, the RAD was like a backdoor regional renaissance initiative tax, and, and it's not. It was simply a way for them to kind of cobble together under plan B, you know, take some of this money, take some of that money, take some of the RAD money, Steelers money, Pirates money, put it all together and, and put it towards the stadium. Yeah, the sense, you know, was, the sense was we don't want it, but they're gonna make sure we get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know, my, my own personal opinion is that, you know, billionaire sports team owners shouldn't get public money. That's, <laughs> that's my own personal opinion. But I will say, at least in the case of Pittsburgh and what we've had, PNC Park and Heinz Field, if you look at, you know, what stadiums are being built for today for $900 million, $1.2 billion, PNC Park was built for something like 216 million. Heinz Field built for 250, 260 million. Inflation adjusted a little bit higher now, but we we've gotten great results from you know what was sort of a, a good bang for your buck sort of value proposition in building those stadiums back in the day. Okay. Yes, sir. So, in other words, for Rad. For us as a club, we ought to seriously think on the naming <laughs> since we're bringing women into it so that by bringing women into it, it makes them more appealing to Ray, right? Now, and now make, he's thinking. And, I, make the I would name, agree, yeah. and make the name more, let's say, palatable. Sure. 
right? Okay, give, give your suggestions in this <laughs> but, but, but it's absolutely the case. I mean, you, that, that's what he's asking, and, and, it, and it's correct. In, in so f well, insofar as we have a, a lot of organizations that you know, seem to have local appeal, but they actually draw from a larger, you know, both audience in terms of people coming to their shows, a larger group of people joining and being a part of it. I think of like, you know, sort of smaller uh, choral groups, smaller, you know, or civic orchestras, uh, smaller performing arts groups that, you know, for instance, uh, the Pittsburgh Savoy Yards who perform Gilbert and Sullivan shows. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a mass appeal. I don't know how you feel about Gilbert and Sullivan, but I'm not, you know, rushing to, to buy tickets. But it does have enough of appeal, enough of a regional importance in arts and culture that the board said, yeah, that, that's worthwhile. That's worth, that's worth a, a very small, when, I, when I'm talking about smaller groups, smaller groups get smaller grants. Mm, it might be $1,000, might be $1,500, but they're all part of the pie of Pittsburgh's arts and culture scene. Any kind of money we can get. I believe it. I believe it. Yes, sir. Um, a question about other counties around us. Has yes. there been any look at it, trying to include them into the regional asset district, and how would that happen? It's a great question. Initially, when the in the early 1990s, when the regional asset district was being talked about, it was the idea that it would be regional, that like, okay, Allegheny County is the important piece right now, but then, you know, could go elsewhere. It could go to Westmoreland County to fund, say, you know, the Westmoreland Museum of Art, or it could go to Washington County to kind of fund the, the local parks that they have there. Um, it's, it's never come about. Any, any you know, county around the area has the opportunity to say, we would like to do the same thing and have a, a sales tax. Um, I will say that there, there was one little trick of wordsmithing that they made in the original Act 77, which is that this applied to any second class county in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, any second class county. Well, there's, there's only one. It's Allegheny County is the only, <laughs> only second class county that exists. So th there would have to be another law passed. So it would have to be both the county agreeing to it and it would have to pass through both chambers of the legislature signed by the governor like it was back in 1993. Good question. Uh, James, I have a question for yes, you. Yes, sir. Since these sports teams are getting public money. Yes. Is there anything in the contracts or what you people do to prevent them from moving, saying, you know, we don't want to be here anymore, like the Raiders have moved to Las Vegas. Sure. That was public money out in California. Yeah. Um, you know, I agree with you, you know, billionaires getting public money for their sports teams and stuff. Sure. Is there anything that keeps like, let's say the, uh, the Rooney sell the team, new owner says, well, I don't want to be in Pittsburgh anymore. I want yeah. to be somewhere else. Better market or whatever, for whatever reason. Sure. They've taken public money yeah. for a lot of years. How, is there anything that prevents them or is there any language in the contract that you have with so, them or whatever it is? Yeah, so I can only speak as far as I know because what RAD actually does is fund the Sports, Sports and Exhibition Authority which then, you know, controls the leases, actually owns the stadium, does, you know, improvements on it, interfaces with the teams. What I know of that is that they, you know, they're guaranteed to stick here as long as their lease is. And so for both the Steelers and for the Pirates, that is through the 2030 season. You know, they signed, they signed a 30-year lease, started in 2001 and went through 2030. After that, I'm not sure. I, I don't work for the sports ex Sports and Exhibition Authority, they, they handle that. And I'm sure, you know, whoever the next county executive is, because we're, we're having this election, the next county executive will probably have that on his or her plate to say, like, all right, what is going to happen after 2030 when these leases um, end up? Uh, they don't pay me enough to figure that out. <laughs> the county executive will, will have that, you know, ability to, to work with them and see. Um, but, but, I guess the specific answer to your question is yes, only so far as the lease goes through 2030. Beyond that, I'm not sure. Uh, James, one question. You keep hearing these issues that come up from time to time with the Steelers and I maybe with the Pirates, yeah. where they're saying we want improvements at the stadium, mm -hmm. but we don't feel that we have to pay for these improvements. Yeah. 
what, where's the dividing line there, if, I, if you could answer that question? The, the dividing line of where is Meaning, that? Uh, is it, when do the Steelers have to pick up oh, sure. expanding the end zone seating versus having the, you know, the, I, your, your, your group, rad group? Yes, I, I get what you mean. It's, it's a very good question. Actually, this has come up twice recently. And again, this is all through the Sports and Exhibition Authority, which we fund, but we don't control. We, we give money to them, but they also get money from hotel taxes, rental car taxes, a bunch of different places. Two examples. One is the new scoreboard at PNC Park. If, you, if you've seen it, you, you know it's, it's, it's quite something. It's quite amazing. Um, they had specific negotiations about how big the scoreboard could get until the pirates had to start paying for it themselves. <laughs> this is all true. You can, you can look back and see. If, if, if you expanded the scoreboard out to these borders, which is basically the structure that they've already built on there, then the Sports and Exhibition Authority paid for it because it was sort of, you know, upkeep in terms of having, you know, a, a good major league quality scoreboard for something that the Sports and Exhibition Authority owns. If it got any larger than that, then beyond that, the Pirates would pay for the extra part of the scoreboard. These are the kinds of things that are, you know, they're silly in one way, but they're also telling you that it's important when you're signing a lease with these teams that you know you want to get into the details, into the nitty gritty, so you're not left holding the bag. What they ultimately decided was that it would mostly be paid for with a $1 per ticket tax that uh, Pirates uh, fans would pay on each ticket that they bought. I believe it's for the next five years. So ultimately, it's being, you know, paid for by a little extra money for the, uh, by the fans per ticket. The second example I give is something that's going to happen in the, in the coming months at PPG Paints Arena. The, the Penguins are, are not in the playoffs, sadly, and there's only one concert set up for this summer. So it's a great opportunity to do renovations and improvements at PPG Paints Arena. One of the things that they're doing is they're adding more luxury suites into the kind of lower areas of the arena and for, for extra ticket revenue essentially like these new arenas have new luxury areas they charge more for that they get more money that is a sort of like penguins benefit so the penguins pay the penguins are funding those improvements down there because they're going to be getting extra money from that but also Along with those renovations, they're also putting in new video screens on the scoreboard. And that's an improvement that benefits all of the fans that go to the games. You get a bigger, you know, brighter scoreboard, better, you know, visuals on it. And so the Sports and Exhibition Authority is paying for that. They own the arena. It's a sort of thing that benefits all of the fans that go. And so they're paying for that. Again, these are all like little, you know, who, who benefits from it, who pays for it. I leave that up to the very well-paid lawyers at the Sports and Exhibition Authority. They they sort it out, but yeah, that is how it how it usually works. Well, they passed it on to the ticket holders. My season penguin season tickets went up one that seat. Yeah, one hundred dollars per seat per game. Yeah, and after they didn't make the playoffs. Uh, yeah, yeah, a yeah. hundred dollars per seat per game. <laughs> and that's a very good question. Yeah, could get some better players make the playoffs again. I'm done. This is the last <laughs> season. I'm done with them. <laughs> any, any other? Any other it, questions? It can be stadium related, but it need not be stadium related. Yes, sir. Uh, was there ever, or is there now, any particular formula for how you allocate that money? Is there a, is there a policy that that says uh, this much can go to this kind of outfit? Or sure. Okay. Yes, um, it's a very good question. That that's that's the sort of nitty gritty that I could have gotten into, but I but I didn't. Um, but here, let me see if I can get back to that slide. All right. So so of of all of this, it this is this is kind of good way to see it from a, a hundred foot view. The nitty gritty of it is that some of these entities have 
specific contracts with RAD that they signed that the zoo says, we agree to do X, Y, and Z, and you agree to give us X amount of money. Those contracts exist for a lot of the, a lot of the larger entities. So Carnegie Library, Allegheny County Library Association, the zoo, FIPS, the aviary, the Carnegie Museums, and a couple other places. So they're all guaranteed a, a certain amount of money. We also guarantee the bonds on the stadiums. So, you know, let's say there, there's a, a, a meteor strike on Western Pennsylvania and tax revenue goes to near zero. The very first tax revenue that would go out the door whether you like it or not, would be to be paying the bonds on the stadiums because they just have a they have the first right of, of peeling any money from that. Beyond that, there's no policy per se, but the idea is usually, you know, one of what what have you had over the last few years, what have you had historically, what are you doing with the money? Can you prove to us that like this is actually sustaining your organization and there, we're not funneling money into something that's just going to close up in a couple of years? You know, how are you doing upkeep? How are you doing outreach? How's your attendance? How's your, how's your, your donations? Like, are you finding more donors to your organization? These are all things that our board looks at and says, you know, yes, they, they are looking, you know, for X amount of money and we can deliver X amount. Um, it basically all relies on the, the requests that these organizations make. And one of the things I didn't get into, but I can very briefly, is that, you know, all of the organizations go in front of our board, these seven folks, in late August, early September, what we call public hearings. They go before them. They have about, you know, anywhere between three to ten minutes to deliver a presentation. They're smaller, it's three minutes. If they're larger, it's 10. And they say, we're looking for $5 million this year. Here's all the things you've asked us to do in the past that we've done. Here's all the things we're looking to do in the future. So please give us $5 million, please. <laughs> and then they decide you know, what goes on from there. They all have their own sort of you know, history, things that they're interested in, in getting more funding for, things that they're interested in not giving funding to. And they work it out, and, and it's, a, it's a great board. And what I think what's most important is they have decided over time and over precedent and over you know, the years that they want the majority of the funding to go to places that are free to the public to use. This is public money, public investment, tax dollars, and so the majority should go to places that people don't have to pay. You don't have to pay to, you, to go to your public library. You don't have to pay to take a walk in Frick Park. So the board has complete discretion on how that funny money is allocated? Other, other than all those things that I laid out earlier of, you know, what they can, what they, what they are eligible to fund and what they can't fund, all, all of those things that are laid out in the law. So by statute, they cannot fund X, Y, and Z. And by statute, they have to fund all of these. Within that framework, basically, yes. All right. Anybody else got a question? James, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate taking your time to come.